Hey everyone, welcome back to the Japan Archives. A uh, bonus for you this week, just to get something out for you, because I am going on holiday for a week. I'm off to Kyoto. I'm very excited for a whole week. But how's things been going for you, Heather? Going along okay. Trying to think of what to say at this point. I've got so many, I've got a lot of、uh, things I'm working on currently, and I'll probably share more about those in the near future, I'm hoping. But right now, it's still in many things in the project stage. But doing all right. How about yourself? Also,、um, I, I forgot I wanted to ask if I could do my, my Shinkansen voice since you're going on the train to Kyoto. You have a Shinkansen voice? Yes. I, I like the, the, the lady who speaks in English is very soothing on the Shinkansen. Better than the English on normal trains. <laughs>、mm. It's, it's just very lovely and peaceful. So, you know, I always go, Welcome to the Shinkansen. It's been so long since I've been on one. I kind、mm -hmm. of forgot how she talks. Oh, you're, you're in for a delightful treat. Welcome to the Shinkansen. Kyoto, stopping at Hakata Station. Please, where the exit is on the left side. Thank you. We're going to talk about the diving women today. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. How do you feel?、I'm, go for it. I'm excited. Oh, before we start, though,、um, our、oh. website hit 90,000 views. Holy crabs. As of this month. Fantastic.、Oh, that's exciting. Do you remember the name of these diving women? What it is in Japanese? Oh, I do not recall. I've heard it, but I don't remember. So in Japan, they are known as Ama. So、ah. a group of women known as Ama, or I guess we would call them diving women. And their job consisted of catching seafood to sell. But over time, these women have grown famous for collecting pearls, which is kind of how. We found out about them as well. The vast majority are women, but that doesn't mean to say a few men haven't also taken up the role over the years. And the word ama itself can also be rendered in different ways using different kanji. One can mean sea woman, one can mean sea man, one can mean sea person, and all of them are read as ama. And there's also another alternative reading for ama coming from Okinawa, which would be read as uminchu. Now, as for the men and the women, the men, it said, would concentrate more on gathering fish, whereas the women would collect shellfish and seaweed from the ocean floors. I've been using a book from 1965 a lot for this research, and it does go into a lot of data about Ama women. They, there w a s even studies about how their height and weight compares to other people who don't go diving all the time and things, charts upon charts upon charts. And it was really interesting. Like overall, they were, well, they weighed more because they had more muscle mass. Their fat content was higher because they had to keep warm in the ocean. They tended to be a little bit taller than other people, but also as well, they had a higher percentage of hearing loss because of the pressure of the water、mm. from constantly diving. So that was. Kind of interesting. But this book from 1965 states that there were, well, at that time, there were around 18,000 Ama in Japan. But these days, in one generation, there is only around 60 or 70.、Mm. So a big, big drop for this、um, very interesting profession. Now, I could just tell you when this profession started, but I want you to guess and try to tell me when you believe it started, Heather. 1300. 1300 years ago or the year 1300? The year 1300. So it's believed that this profession has been around for 2000 years. Oh. And the oldest reference we have for them fr comes from a document known as the Gishi Wajin Den, or an account of the people of War. Now, this is a Chinese text, and War was the old name China gave to the people of Japan and the country. And this particular document was thought to have been written around 268. BC, so more than 2000 years, 2200 or so years. Now, the first actual record that we have does date to a lot later. We have a first recording pearl divers from 927 AD、hmm. during the Han period, and these women were known as divers who would collect seafood, but they were collecting seafood for、um, income. And to make a livelihood, but they were also honored with the role of collecting abalone、ah. to be taken to shrines for the emperor. And obviously, diving is a profession now where people use diving uniforms, they use scuba gear and everything、mm -hmm. now. So,、yeah. what do you think they wore 
prior to this to go diving? Hmm, probably not a lot. I forget what it's called for the men, but the um, I've seen it sometimes for certain ceremonies where it's just the is it fundoshi, I think is what it's called. And I'm assuming women have a similar apparatus. Is apparatus the right word? I guess you could call it. Well, no, it'd be a uniform, no? No ah, apparatus. Yeah. They they were the same thing. They were the loincloth. They were the fundoshi. Mm -hmm. And most of them would swim topless. They would just have the loincloth. Yeah, that would make sense. And yeah, it was only in the 20th century that they actually took up the use of a diving uniform. However, they do still continue to this day to dive without the use of scuba gear or air tanks. Mm. So they're still doing the profession by just holding their breath. As in breath, I can barely hold my breath underwater for long. I don't know how they could hold it for a minute, two minutes. I read something somewhere oh, in the mists of time in my head. The mists of time. Yeah. <laughs> Cobwebs up there. Yeah, there's different like techniques for I should remember there's a book I read too about breathing. It was really fascinating that I need to finish. I think you know, there's different like techniques you can do for breathing and different practices that you can do to increase. Plus, I would assume it's a profession that's been passed down in families. So I'm I don't know if perhaps they had a higher lung capacity. It was like a genetic thing that got passed down, or this particular people in this particular region. An interesting question. It's not something I came across. I mean, definitely a lot of these women took up the jobs of their mothers, so they did continue on the profession. But there were also girls who would come in who have never done it before, mm -hmm. but yet they still could learn or develop the capacity to hold their breath for these long periods of time. So that kind of leads us on to the next part I have in my notes is like, when did they start their training or learning to mm -hmm. become an Alma diver? Girls could have been as young as 12 or 13 when they began their training from an older ama diver. Of course, they were trained to expect a lot for their new job that was going to be at sea. The ocean could be a very harsh place. They would have to endure freezing waters, the pressure of the ocean, which would increase the deeper they dived. And these women actually did develop a unique breathing practice, but this was for when they resurfaced. And mm. part of this breathing process was kind of letting out a long whistle sound as they resurfaced. Now, the 1965 book also lists a few diving patterns for these women. And the in essence, there was three different ranks, I guess you could say. There was the koisodo, the nakaisodo, and the oisodo. So the first, the koi sodo, girls held the role of, they would walk the shorelines to try and find seaweed and things that they could collect, but they would also dive, but only from between two to four meters. They would always attach themselves via a rope to a wash tub, which would float on the ocean. And when they came back up from a dive, they could put all their things in there. So throughout the day, they could just add more to the wash tub and then they could take it end of the day to sell. This role, as it was based near the shoreline and only shallow diving, this was the role usually done by those who were coming into training for the first time. Next, the Nakai Sodo, they were those with a little bit more experience and they were, it was like the promotion from the Koi Sodo, basically. And these girls would be around 15 to 20 years old at this point and they would then start diving from four to seven meters down this would then be aboard a boat because they're a bit further out at sea and the boat would have other ama divers they would go as a group and when they dived into the ocean they would still have their wash tubs to collect their harvests and the final one would have been the Oisodo. They were the most well-trained, they were the oldest ones, and they were often the mentors. And they usually would dive anywhere between 10 to 25 meters. Ooh. Uh, some of these divers, for instance, those on Kyushu, would wear a weighted belt of lead to help them sink faster as they needed to conserve their oxygen and make the best usage of it. And these would also hold a kaigane with them, which was a kind of small blade, and they would just like stick it in their loincloth for when they needed it. The book also goes on to say that they would usually do 50 dives in a morning, and another 50 in the afternoon. And when resting, they could rest upon their wash tubs because they would float in the water, or they could return to the boat and warm up there as these boats actually had a fire pit in them in the middle. 
so they could also, it said, warm their tea to try and warm up on their break. That is incredibly impressive. And I guess it would be the time of year too. So in the summer, perhaps maybe still would need to warm up, but it get a fall or even, I guess, I don't know if they dived in winter or not, but that's just to kind of rest like on the ocean, not come back to the boat. I guess depending how far out you swam, there was a lot of other women you'd probably have to each have your own territory. Well, from what I was reading about their diving patterns, they the best harvest time was summer, but they would also dive in spring and autumn or fall if you're American. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't read anything about the winter, I guess, obviously. I mean, most animals, most crops there, they don't have winter harvest. Winter was not really a time for diving, at least in regards to trying to harvest seaweed, harvest fish and things. This hasn't really covered the idea of why we know what they're famous for now. Mm -hmm. In regards to why do we know about their pearl diving? When did this actually start? Like I said, we had a record from 927 AD, AD talking about pearl divers. But in their original form, it was actually very rare for them to do so and collect pearls. It wasn't something they would dive to intentionally look for. It was if they happened to come across one, they would collect them. Mm -hmm. Like it was more important to gather the seaweed and the fish and the shellfish because they needed the income to survive. And it was only as late as 1893 that their famous pearl collectors actually started to happen. And this was mostly due to a man known as Mikimoto Kokichi. And so in essence, even though they have been around for 2000 years, it's only the last 100 years or so that this group has become associated with this activity that they're now famous for in Japan. Mikimoto Kokichi, he both discovered and began the production of the cultured pearl, establishing the Mikimoto Pearl Diving Island in Toba. And it was here he recruited Ama divers to be able to grow his business, even taking it internationally at some point. The mm. Ama divers here now are seen very much as a tourist attraction which for me feels a little bit disheartening. It's almost like their traditional jobs turn into a, like a gimmick kind of thing. But I think that's just me. It's still nice that they still get to do it, but very much it's moved away from their traditions of gathering fish, gathering seaweed. They are just diving for collecting pearls for this company. And as for Mikimoto-san, I think it could be possibly interesting to mention him at a talk about him at a later date but if you do want to buy some of his pearls you can go to the mikimoto pearl shop in ginza the store is still there to this day if you need some pearls head over to ginza although ginza is a very expensive place in tokyo so i don't want to i don't want to come even think about how much a pearl necklace could be there window shop but for the ama divers you know, there's not much more to say now about them. It, like we said, it's a bonus. And I, I feel that there are less and less now every generation. Mm -hmm. And perhaps yeah. they won't last much longer in their traditional role. Perhaps eventually the divers that still claim to be Amar divers will only solely be pearl collectors soon at some point. But we will just have to see how it goes. Obviously, things have changed now. You have overfishing you have all of this that makes everything so much easier so you don't necessarily need to be someone who has to go through rigorous training to dive a hundred times a day to collect some seaweed when you could just have a seaweed farm now and make your life so much easier but that is their legacy that is where they originated and that is how they are now in japan but i will leave you with two more things there is an ukiyo-e print by Hokusai, oh. and the title is The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife, but it does also go by the name of Girl, Diver, and Octopi. You're nodding your head. You know where I'm going with this. I and know this where you're going as soon as you said it. <laughs> and this print is included in a three-volume book from 1814 of Shunga Erotica, as it depicts an ama diver sexually entwined with two octopuses. Octopi. It's octopuses, octopode. I believe. I don't know. I think Is it's. It? I think. I go off. I go off QI for many years ago. <laughs> and our final note for this for today, though we have no poetry corner usually in our bonus episodes, mm -hmm. there is a poem on Amadivas that I found. Oh. 
A journal article I mentioned says that there is a poem in the Manyoshu, so I did some research and managed to find poem on the wakapoetry.net website we use from time to time. Mm -hmm. well, I guess I will read the Japanese and you can try to translate how the turntables. It does indeed. Oh, are you ready? Oh, God, yes, maybe. <laughs> Kimi o Matsu. Matsu ura no ura no. Otomera wa Tokoyo no kuni no. Ama otome kamo. Man. Oh, I should say probably the poem itself comes from the Manyoshu, book five, poem 865, if anyone ever wants to find it. Hmm, I recognized a few words. Which um, words? It's a kuni of country. Kind of, yeah. Kind of. And kimi, like, it's kind of like towards feelings or emotions, I think. And then I ma matsu is like waiting. Is that a verb or is it a different? Oh, yeah. The first line, kimi o matsu, it's like awaiting. Okay. And then, oh, something, it was a, oh, and they hear otohime, like princess? Otome kamo. Okay. Mm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm tapping out. What you got? <laughs> All right. So kimi o matsu, awaiting my lord. So kimi mm -hmm. is an old tactile um, that different nobles would have. There was different... It originates from the Kabane system, which was a kind of system of different job titles that were bestowed, bestowed on different people. So there was Muraji, there was Omi, and there was Atae, and Kimi was also one of the titles. So mm -hmm. you were right in thinking the Kimi you were thinking, but mm -hmm. in the context of this one, it refers Mother. to the title that people would have had. So it's been translated here as my lord. So awaiting my lord. Matsu ura no ura no, on the shore of Pine Tree Bay. We've had ura before in another poem. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think it's being used in the context of shoreline or edge. Mm -hmm. uh, Matsu ura was a uta makura, so a pillow word that would mm. people would instantly know what this thing means. So, like Pine Tree Bay was a specific place in Japan that would conjure certain emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. Otomera wa. The Maidens. Ah, okay. Tokoyo no Kuni no has been translated here as paradises. So mm -hmm. we kind of talked about Kuni in regards of it being like a district or a province in Japan. And Tokoyo, we mentioned actually in the Shinto stories, Tokoyo was the everworld, a paradise place where the gods would go and you would never die. And there was the golden cockerels and those beautiful oranges. So it was... Tokoyo no Kuni is like the, the paradise realm, kind of. And Ama Otome Kamo, diving girls do seem to be. So bringing that all together for you, it mm. translates as Awaiting my lord on the shore of Pine Tree Bay. The maidens, paradise's diving girls do seem to be. It's lovely. It's quite lovely. Mm. Oh, I like that very much. Mm. Yeah, that one was that's so difficult to translate. There's a few words in there that it's with the kimi i was um, i'm glad that you ran ran into that that's why i kind of like this poem like there's a lot of it in there that i from the research i've done i can understand the cultural context and ex explain it quite in depth so yeah kimi being the job title matsuura being the pillow word tokoyo being the paradise country that we've talked about before like we've actually have a poem where we know all of the things in there and we can interpret it instead of trying to think does it mean this does it mean that let's check with yeah. the professor <laughs> or let's just throw something out there and maybe it'll stick <laughs> yeah oh yeah i love i love that oh i'm so oh i was have to sit and think for a minute because it's just so nice and yeah i love the way you analyze that that was oh so much happiness okay i am reflected i have i'm i'm on, on to the next <laughs> so what did you think then about the ama divers was there anything in there that surprised you or the, we both came into this blind I, I the pearl diving i was aware of i had mm. heard about before i i even think there was there's a a book which i might have to look like a novel about pearl divers that i saw a long time ago so I, I was aware of them, and I think I've heard that there was maybe something I've seen on a news news program before, because they'll often talk about different cultural things that are done more for tourists. I think like was it cormorant fishing, 
where they they still do this traditional fishing with birds, but it's basically just for show as opposed to a steady livelihood. So I, I wasn't definitely was not aware it was that that long of a history. I, I mean, I probably should have known, but I didn't know it. <laughs> so that was po possibly more recent. Mm, and I d wasn't aware about the culture pro culture pearls. That was completely new to I me. I was not. I always mm. kind of assumed they were diving for actual pearls, mm -hmm. not this. Mm -hmm. I was reading that they would dive down to get the shell, and then they would place inside the thing that would then grow into the pearl, and then they would have to dive back down again to place it on the sea floor, and then eventually dive again when they know it's been enough time to collect the pearls. It's kind of fascinating to read mm -hmm. about. Oh, it'd be interesting to, to see too. I think so, yeah. We mm -hmm. just have to go to Kyushu. On the list. On the list. Add it to the list. But in regards to going to Kyoto, for you and the listeners, I am going to go to the temple that had the Chojugin Giga, the animal scrolls. I'm going to go there, get some pictures for us. Oh. I'm going to try to get to Nara to go to the pack to try and find those pantomime masks, get some pictures for everyone. Also, I'm next to Gion, so I can have a walk around <gasps> and relive the days of Mineko. And also, mm -hmm. very close by to Gion is Otani Cemetery, where Madame Oima was buried. So I want to go and try and get a picture of the cemetery. Mm, it's video. It's a video, two of you walking through Gion. That would be awesome. I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore. Lots of people were taking pictures, so they've put up signs against taking photos because a lot of Gion is still owned privately by people and they didn't want their homes being taken pictures of. I think you need a you need a permit for Gion to take photos, last I remember. So take video of before you approach to Gion. <laughs> mm, but yeah, where we're staying is literally over the bridge just outside Gion, like the southern side. So we can cross, walk through and end up then at the top of the busy top side. Mm. Oh, I'm so excited for you. Oh, so excited. Anyway, guys, thank you for tuning in this week. Um, we hope you enjoyed the bonus. I was very excited to read about this. I kind of want to buy the book from 1965. I found an online copy, but I couldn't read all of it. Uh, I kind of want to read more about all the tests they did, like height, weight, and see how mm -hmm. diving affected them more. I think it'd be super interesting. Uh, but anyway, that is everything for me. How about you, Heather? That's great. I'm good. <laughs> All right, then. So we'll talk to you soon, guys, when I'm back from Kyoto and we can finish up Mineko's story. Matane. Matane.